Sejam bem-vindos de volta, vamos voltar para recomeçar. A gente manteve aqui no telão o QR Code para quem não conseguiu acessar o report das macro tendências 2024 e 2025. É só você apontar a câmera do seu celular. A partir do momento que você apontar a câmera do seu celular, vai aparecer como se fosse um linkzinho. Você clica nesse link, tá, gente? Não é para tirar foto do QR Code. Aponta a câmera e clica no linkzinho que aparecer. A gente vai deixar aqui porque algumas pessoas não conseguiram pegar o report. E quero lembrar também que aqui... No, na Praça Cinza, que é bem em frente, a gente tem uma experiência de realidade virtual muito legal da Voice of the Oceans. É, a gente coloca ali o óculos, eu participei um pouquinho antes da gente começar aqui. É uma experiência de como se fosse um mergulho em que a gente consegue entender o impacto que o lixo tem nos oceanos, o impacto que ele tem sobre os animais. Então, é muito legal porque você vê ali os bichinhos, você ajuda, faz uma experiência ali de ajudar a limpar, ajudar a salvar, resgatar os animais. É bem bacana. Só seguir aqui em frente na Praça Cinza. Sem mais delongas, vamos receber aqui agora a palestra do Andy Hines. Ele que vai falar sobre estudos de futuros que vão além de uma previsão simplista e nos levam a uma exploração profunda das possibilidades futuras. A proposta do Andy é provocar a gente para questionar as nossas próprias suposições e adotar uma mentalidade mais flexível e adaptável para enfrentar os desafios de, do amanhã. No final da palestra dele, vai ter um espaço, um momento para perguntas e respostas. Lembrando, a palestra dele vai ser em inglês. Você que quer tradução simultânea, já corre ali para poder pegar o seu fone. E a partir de agora, a gente vai começar já a entrar no inglês. So Let's receive here on stage Andy Hines to talk about how to think about futures. I welcome him to the stage. He's the professor and coordinator of the Foresight Program at the University of Houston. Welcome. Hello. What have I learned from 30 years of studying the future. Change is slower, repeat, slower than we think. We do our homework, study the future, think about the future of our topic. We will not be surprised by change. We will see it coming, I promise you. So today, I'm going to give you 12 ways to think about the future so you will not be surprised by change. That's the promise. Oh. oh. What do futurists do that's different than normal people? We all think about the future. Futurists have a methodology. We have six steps, but let me tell you, there's really two things we do. Number one, we try to understand, we create a map of what the future might look like, part one. Part two, we say, with that map, how do we influence the future, work towards the future we want, avoid the future we don't want, and be ready for anything in between? Number one, we have methodology for that. Number two, as, as a futurist community, we have agreed, more or less, how to do the work. These six basic steps, 80% of the futurists do the same thing. We agree that these, we've come together as a community and said, here's how you do it. It's not complicated. It's hard work, but it's not complicated. But we also say, even though we agree on the basic way to explore the future, there's lots of variety. There's not one right way There's lots of different ways, to do it, lots of different tools to do the same thing. So if you are an aspiring futurist, you can decide how you want to explore the future. You have your own personal, we say, your special sauce for exploring the future. So lots of different techniques. Now, I've mentioned these six steps. Here's the first step, frame the project you're going to explore the future about, okay? 
This looked familiar from the last presentation, different words. Three horizons. We use this with clients all the time. They get it. It's simple, it's easy, and it gives people a way to talk about the future. The uh, y-axis, strategic fit, says, how well do we understand what's happening? Right? The first horizon, the next few years, well, we understand that pretty good. Second horizon, when the big disruptions potentially happen, three, five, ten years from now, we don't, we can, if we study the future, we can see those emerging disruptions right now. Just not as clearly as we see the first horizon. If we study, in any topic that we've studied, I've done maybe a hundred over the last 30 years, there's five or six major horizon two changes typically in any topic. Not that many, five or six. Big changes. You can see them right now. We just can't tell which ones. We can't tell exactly when. We can't tell how they might come together. But we will not be surprised by a major shift. Horizon 3. We can see the Horizon 3 long-term future right now if we look. But we can see it very fuzzy. Many, many, many promising things that could happen that never do or they take a really long time. I'll give you an example. 1993, I, I went to General Motors, the car company, to work on intelligent vehicle highway systems, which meant self-driving cars. 1993, that's 30 years ago. Just now, finally, we're almost there. We have a couple driving, but it's taken 30 years. 1996, I worked on the project they called the Future of Desktop Manufacturing. Now we call it 3D printing. 1996, just coming now. Lots and lots of examples where, again, if you study the future, you see those changes coming. And it takes forever. It's boring. I'm bored. It takes forever for these changes to happen. I wish they would go faster. Okay. We'll come back and you'll see the three horizons again. We use it a lot in our project work. Okay. So I said, we, ex we think of ex the future like an exploration. We're going to explore. And if you're exploring, what do you first thing you do? You create a map. Where are we going to go? We call it a domain. Domain is a fancy word for topic. A domain map. The future of communities, the future of libraries, the future of AI, whatever it might be. We start with a, we call that a domain, and we create a map of that topic. Now, you'll notice there's, there's the, the uh, um, around the edge, the gray bubbles, steep, social, technological, economic, environmental, political. Those are the changes outside the domain that may come and impact it. In the middle, the bubbles in the middle are the domain itself. What does that topic look like? If we're going to understand that topic, how do we map it? Something like this. We did a project on the future of communities in the year 2040. And we said, if we're going to understand the future of communities, what topics should we go look at? You can see the major five categories, right? And it creates, it's a simple way to say, all right, here's how we explore the future. Now, sometimes we get carried away and we get too complicated. <laughs> this was the future of libraries. Librarians thought we had to have every single bubble ever invented, so it was too busy. But, you know, what are you going to do? But, again, it helps to say, we, now, what are the trends? What are the issues? What's happening in each of these bubble areas? It gives us a way to explore, a guide to explore the future. But keep it simple. Okay. All right, the second thing we do is we scan for signals of change. And we use our map, right? Now, what we do is we, we try to find the signals of change. Uh, yeah, there we go. Then we collect them. Then we say, are they any good? Are they useful? Now, here's the big thing about scanning really hard, really hard. 
Some of the signals are very, very strong. Lots of evidence, all the experts agree. We say that's the horizon one baseline and don't need futurists for that, right? It's already happening. What, is a, what does a futurist do? We want to say, how is the future different? The alternative scenarios. The evidence is weak. So we're telling people that the best way to look for the future is to find the weak evidence, the fringe, the edge, not the, ex not the experts, not the mainstream, but the new, the new and emerging voices. That's where you find change. Now, we've done a lot of work with the CDC, the big public health agency in the US. They're so smart. All they want to do, they only want to pay attention to this. They, they've been trained that way their whole life to look for the, the good evidence. But they're not good futurists. <laughs> they never find anything. We're trying to train them to understand the future comes, the future starts, the first ideas about how things will be different come from the edge and they're weak at first. And people go, uh, what? That's when you know you've got a weak signal that might tell you how things are different. So we look for the weak signals to tell us the, what future is coming. And then we, we, can't, we have some tool for collecting it. We use Digo, Raindrop, there's all kinds of software tools to capture those signals of change. So when we do a project with a client, like this one on the future of communities, I think we had mm, 300 or so signals of change and we gathered them together in a nice software library. So you need some way to capture all the stuff. Oh, it's so nice. It takes about 60 seconds, maybe 90 seconds when you find an interest, you're reading an article, you go, ooh, that's interesting. It takes about 90 seconds to put it in the library. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. Okay, you can see horizon H1, H2, H3 are three horizons. So when we find a signal of change, which horizon is it? Is it first horizon? Eh, we're not so interested, but we keep it anyway. Second horizon, mm, yeah. Third horizon, kind of depends. Sometimes the clients are interested in third horizon, but most of the time it's the second horizon. That, that's why they're giving us, that's why they're paying us, right? They want to know what's the next big change. Not what's 50, 30, 50 years, but what's 10 to 20 years, typically. Make sense? Okay, so we scan, we find all these signals of change, and now we want to say, what does that look, what does the, what does the future look like? The first step that we do, after we do our research, it might take six weeks of looking for scanning, for trends, for issues, and we try to synthesize, pull it all together into key drivers of change. And, and most, domains or topics, there's about 12, plus or minus. So that says, when we, when we investigated this domain, these are the most important things about the future of that domain. Then we're going to use those most important things, themes of change, to build our scenarios, or stories about how the future could be different. So very important to get your drivers, set them, and feel like this, these are, we believe these. These are very solid um, clues about how the future might be different. Okay. How do we understand the future? We use stories. Everybody understands stories, right? There's lots of different ways you can do stories. Uh, we did a study maybe a few years back. We found 26 different techniques for scenarios or storytelling about the future. What's, the, what's really happening here? Scenarios are just techniques to tell stories about data. There's just different ways you can do that. Now, I, I've told you I've been studying the future for 30 years. I use about three or four different techniques. I don't, you don't need to know 20 ways. You need to know a couple. And most futurists tend to find a technique that they like and they stick with it. Maybe vary it once in a while. You don't have to know a whole, you don't have to know 20 things, you have to know two or three. Okay, this particular technique, ah, there's our three horizons again. We love that. Did I tell you that we like that? Yeah. Um, three, what 
What does the next few years look like? We call that the baseline future. And then we say, eventually, the domain will change and be a new system, Horizon 3. So Horizon 1, current system. Horizon 3 is the new system. We usually tell two stories about what the new system could look like. In the middle, the zone of transition. How do we get to the new system? Collapse says the current system falls apart and then we rebuild a new one. Makes sense, right? That probably. When we did some research, we found more common, we call it new equilibrium, says it's gradual. Think of it like this. I'm a per Imagine that the, the topic you're studying is a person. You start to change. It gets really new and scary. Ah! And then you check it out and you retreat. New equilibrium, we start to change, we pull back. Start to change, pull back, and eventually we get there. Our research says more commonly, it's more common to do the start and stop than it is to collapse. Collapse is bad. It's hard to recover from collapse. Very scary. Okay. So that's one of the ways that we tell stories about the future. We have five stories. We used our drivers that came from the scanning. Started with the domain map. See how it all fits together? Isn't that lovely? <laughs> OK. So this uh, project we did on the future of libraries in Seattle, very big library system. They have 28 branches, very, very big and important. Right. They wanted to understand how libraries were changing. Now, I think we, everybody in the room says, yeah, they sure are, right? Woo. Are they even going to exist in the future, right? Pretty good question, yeah. So. Now, one thing you'll notice is the technique here is a little bit different. We had a preferred future. What's that? Sometimes, after we've done our stories about the future, then we go back to the client and say, what do you want to happen? If you could create the future that you wanted, what would it look like? But it has to be plausible. It has to be believable or nobody will pay attention to it. What is your preferred future? That can really help an organiz a client or an organization start to go, oh, now we know where we want to go. We understand that, that we understand change. We've been looking at it. We understand it. We understand how the future might be different, but here's where we want to go. And we create a map. You know, we create the story of what that looks like. Oh, wonderful. Okay. Beautiful. So, oh, oh, sorry. There. Sorry about that. <laughs> we did some research, and you said, because I have said that there is a pattern. We go from horizon one to horizon two. To horizon three. All we, when we do projects, we thought that's how, that seems to be how it happened. We wanted to be sure. So we went back and gathered 78 scenario sets, basically scenarios that projected the future from the past. And we looked at them and said, did they follow this pattern or not? And what we found was, like, it's, we found a couple of things. Yes, baseline, horizon two, horizon three, to transformation. What we found, it's very, very, very rare to go from baseline straight to horizon three transformation. Hard, we, we saw it once. Very rare. So it's very rare to go from current system all the way to new. There's that transition in between. We would have guessed that collapse was the more common path. Nope. I already mentioned new equilibrium by far was the more common pattern. Start, stop, start, stop, start, stop. In this example here, we did the future of knowledge work in 2007. 
And we called the baseline about virtual teams. Seems like old news now, right? It should, because it was 2007 when we were talking about it. <coughs> we, did not, the, the, we did not collapse. We did not collapse. We moved into socially centric work. The use of social media and all the collaborative tools. Yes, right? Pretty good. Um, and then we said uh, by 2020, when, today, we would have personalized professions where each person would um, seek to mm, basically um, become a knowledge worker in control of their own career. So if you're a very talented individual, you call the shots, the personalized professions. Mm, pretty much true. In knowledge work, pretty much true. So we would say that this is a, an example of a, of a domain that went from Horizon 1 to Horizon 2 to Horizon 3. And when we looked at those 78 sets, it's very, very common pattern. It's not 100% true all the time, but it's pretty close. But that tells us, remember, if we study the future, if we, identify, if we, if we understand our, our domain, we'll see that change coming. So the second part, after we've mapped the future, we say, all right, what does this mean to us? If I'm a client, what do I do with it? The first thing we try to imagine is, if a scenario happened, and even if we don't believe it, sometimes we don't believe scenarios, like we're, we're on a team, we're like, ah, oh, I, don't, I don't, we have to pretend. If it happened, what would be the consequences for the client, right? So, in this, in this scenario, we imagined it was in the year 2040, there's a lot more volunteer work. Volunteer, volunteer work is a lot more common. We have something called a universal basic income that helps people meet their basic needs. So a lot, a lot, of, a lot more work was voluntary. Now 2040, that's a long time, right? Okay. And what we find in good futures work is almost everybody, anybody can think of the first order impact. And most business, most organizations stop there. We say keep going. What happens after that? What happens after that? And, and until we get to something that says, ooh, that's different. That's interesting. So we imagine here what might be really interesting is now, instead of businesses screening out applicants, businesses are asking, please come work for us. This is a great place to work. We offer wonderful amenities. We're in a great location. Please, please come for us. So you see a shift in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the balance of power between organizations and workers. Now it's the workers who call the shots. Okay, so that's a third order impact, right? So the, these implications or impacts give us ideas about how the future might be different that are relevant to the client. We've connected the future to what the client cares about. Next. From, we uh, typically brainstorm hundreds of those implications or those impacts. And then we say out of those hundreds of things that could happen, which ones really matter to the client? And we usually do, I don't know, six or so for each scenario. Say, I, if this scenario happened, here are six major things that the client could do about it. So again, we're trying to make sure that when we explore the future, we bring it back to the present and say, hey, here's what you can do. All right. So um, we usually do this in a workshop setting with the client. And um, the ones in bold here, are the ones that the client chose. They say, oh, we want to do more work on these particular ones. So we had, oh, what, let's see, eight, 15, we had 29 different issues for the client to consider, and here's what we do with them. We use a tool, it's a very simple tool, called an elevator speech, and it imagines that you have, like, an elevator ride. You have two minutes to explain to somebody, what are you doing? What did you do in that workshop with the futurist? Did you do anything useful? Yes, we did. 
We identified some things that we might go ahead and do as, a, as an organization. Um, so in this case, we talked about um, some ways that we might change higher education, right? And you can see phase one, phase two, phase three. Look familiar? Kind of like the three horizons. So we try to use that thinking over and over again to kind of to help the clients understand that there's a different, the future isn't the same. The future is in different, there's different kinds of futures that are important. Horizon one's already here. Horizon three may or may not happen. Interesting to keep an eye on. Horizon two is typically where the really, the real interesting work happens. Okay, okay so horizon two. One of the other things that we do in this kind of work is who owns it? So if we do a workshop and we say, oh, here's all the things that we might do based on this future, we want to make sure that before, so before we leave the room, before we leave the workshop, somebody says, yep, that's me. I, I, I will follow up on that. You've, maybe you've done workshops before where everyone goes, oh, that's great, and then we, everyone runs away and then nothing happens. So we try, we try to avoid that, right? So then you say, all right, the workshop is done, the project is done, we have all these uh, ideas about what we might do. What happens afterwards? Now one of the things that I mentioned, having been a futurist for a long time, in the past maybe we weren't so good at following up and keeping our eyes on the future. But in the last few years, now we're finding clients are more willing to watch pay attention, and actually see what is happening. We've identified these potentially changes that are, that are interesting to us. Let's see are they, which ones are actually happening, which ones are not happening, how, how fast are they going. Okay. So in this, uh, in this project, we work with the um, Forest Service. We identified, uh, I think, uh, 14 emerging issues. I'm just showing you six here. So we had for six of the issues that they said were important for the future of forest. And then we said, let's see how did they move. Uh, we started this project in 2014. We did the work in 2020. So over six years, did we see any movement of these changes that we said were interesting? So let's pick out the two fun ones. <coughs> Have you seen the vertical forest before? So you, you basically build nature into a building. We, start, we, st we saw that in 2014. It's, uh, those, there's about 12, 12 of them in the world. They're all done by one firm that's in Italy. Um, Stefano Boeri is the architect, and they've been doing these projects around the world. So he started doing them in 2014 or so. In 2020, the only one who's making these buildings is still Stefano. So we said, we called them vertical, we call these vertical forests. It started in Horizon 3, and it's still in Horizon 3. It did not break into the mainstream, it's still on the edge. Now it's interesting, we'll keep our eyes on it, but it really hasn't moved very much. But, let's take another one. Might be a little bit hard to tell, but this is a tall wood building. <laughs> Very, uh, in 2014, we saw a lot of scanning about wood skyscrapers. We're like, what? But we, we studied further and said, yes, you can do this. Okay. So in 2014, Horizon 3, we called, it the, we called it the coming age of wood, right? So it's in Horizon 3. However, what happened from 2014 to today is it has crossed over. There are now mainstream architecture firms that are doing tall wood buildings. There's one in Houston. And it's, it's by the most conservative <laughs> architecture design firm there is. So that was a switch, right? It went from the fringe, it went from the edge, crossed into the mainstream. So we say that is now whoops, in Horizon 2. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so you see the pattern? 
when you watch the future, so we're watching, if you were watching Vertical Forest and people said, what are you going to do? You'd say, nothing. Chill out. Not happening. If you were watching tall wood buildings and someone said, should we do something? Yeah, probably. It's moving. It's crossing over. Right? We, so when we identify change we're interested in, we watch it, we can literally see whether it moves or not. How, how can you be surprised? Now, the only reason we're surprised is because it's a lot of work, right? It's hard work to do that. But you can, if, you, if you do it, it works. Okay. All right. One more. The last tip. So most of the tips I've given you are very practical. Again, i have uh, working with maybe 100 client projects over the years. If you want if you want them to pay you, if you want them to come back, you have to give them very practical results that they can use. Study the future, they make good decisions, right? But, you know, we're all human beings here, right? We also, I think we, we have a, I don't know, obligation to help the future. One of the reasons I got into becoming a futurist, so when we ask new students who come to my program, how did you get to the... University of Houston master's program in foresight. This is what they say. I stumbled upon it. Almost always use that word, stumbled upon it. And then they go, oh, wow, this is it, man. I love it. So I stumbled upon the future, and I read a book about images of the future. And what, they, what the book said was that we're not really creating desirable images of the future. And if you watch Netflix, there's a whole series of category now called dystopia, or post-apocalypse, zombies. All of our views about the future are negative. They're terrible. No wonder we're depressed. So I ask you, and I, I am doing it now. I'm working on a book. Um, it's about the 20-year future. It's called After Capitalism. It's like, what's next after capitalism? What would what, what that world look like? And I've created three different visions of what um, what that could look like. Okay, that, that tells me my time is near. So, one of the things I, I, you know, in addition to all the practical work we do, can we dream big and think big and say, where do we want to go? And what that research about images of the future says is we need that. We need some target, some direction, and a positive one. So I put that challenge to you today. Can we create positive images of the long-term future? But we've got to have a plan. And what we say here is the best way to build a long-term future is you've got to measure it. You've got to make sure that you have the rules of the system. But most important and the hardest thing to do is to have that change of mindset. How can the future really be different than today? That's hard to do. Most important thing, but hardest to do. Okay. So let's just look again here to wrap up. You see my 100% guarantee. If you do your homework about the future, you will not be surprised. And you can see, here's some of the tips, some of the ways we do that. I'm, lo I'm looking at you. I see the nods. You can do this. Only difference, I guess, between y'all and a professional futurist is we practice. Practice a lot, and you get better at it. So I hope that I've got some of you on the journey to becoming futurist and bringing futures thinking to your organization so we can get to those better futures. So I'll stop there, and we'll do some questions. Pessoal, a gente vai entrar agora no momento de perguntas. Quem quiser fazer pergunta, é só levantar a mão que o microfone vai estar passando. Importante, a gente tem 15 minutinhos para esse período de perguntas para o Andy. Então, que sejam perguntas bem objetivas para a gente poder, para ele poder atender o máximo possível de pessoas, tá? Quem quiser, é só levantar a mão que o microfone vai estar passando. Ele já está aqui com o fonezinho dele, pode fazer pergunta em português tranquilo. Em relação ao Bill Greens, é, não vai vingar essa possibilidade de condomínios verdes 
porque aqui no, no, no Brasil a gente tem visto muitos condomínios já com essa tendência. Ok, so, um, very. One of the things. Why does why is change so slow? Usually, it's not the technology. Usually, the technology can work. In this case, we know how to build green condos. We know how to do it. We can do it right now. What slows it down? Regulations, right? And regulations are designed, you know, to reflect, at least in theory, the will of the people. Most people would prefer things to stay the same. We're not all futurists. We like change. That's why we're here. You're here because you like change. But you ain't normal. Right? Normal people are, oh, but green buildings? What are we doing? Yep. And so it ends up that the, it's usually we can do it, but it takes a long time for the social, the culture, the government, the politics to catch up. Yeah, good question. Thank you very much for your presentation. Congratulations. You mentioned that the key uh, and most important thing is to change mentality on your speech. Can you talk a little bit more about it? Us as an individual, how? And maybe to explore some examples as well? Okay. So one of the jobs I had as a futurist, I worked in Kellogg's, the cereal company, in market research in the late 1990s. One of the ideas that we identified from our research was natural foods. Simple idea, right? When we talk to potential consumers or customers, they're like, what is that? How do I know it's really true? How do I, you know? What we realize that anytime you introduce something that's really new, usually you have to educate your customers. And when you have to, ed if you find yourself saying, we need to educate our customers, know right off the bat you're in for a long haul. It takes a long time to educate consumers, educate customers. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we try to be as futurists is we try to be patient. And our advice is start slow. For, for the natural foods, really slow. One or two things, learn, you know, because we, we knew it was going to take 20, 10, 20 years. So when it's really new, when it's really provocative, know it's going to take a long time. Know that you're going to have to build awareness. And just be very patient and start slow. Where we got in trouble. I'll tell you one, one of our other stories. We did, remember functional foods? It was like smart foods, or you put medicine right into the food? We did that too. Built a whole new lab. We had 25 people. We had, pasta, we had smart pasta. We had smart cereal. We had smart Twinkies. We had smart everything. We launched it all. And we sold about three, three boxes. Nobody, everyone was like, what? Medicine and food? Yikes. We were... So we spent way too much money early on before people were ready. So when it's really new, it, you have to be patient, build awareness over time, and run some small experiments to learn. All right, while, while that's coming, so really quick. Right now, circular economy. You've heard a lot about the circular economy. Don't take your time. It's going to take a long time to get to the circular economy. Don't put too many resources in it early, uh, you'll, you just lose your money. So start, it's a patient 20 year project. But you can do stuff now, but just small. Okay. You get the idea. Sorry. Bom dia, obrigada pela palestra. Eu gostaria de saber se o senhor também pesquisa é, essa, é, essas técnicas para planejar o futuro e para tornar o futuro real no campo da política. Porque uh, eu, eu vejo que as, as instituições políticas, os partidos, são muito conservadores e o nosso sistema todo necessita de muitas mudanças para poder é, adotar mais rapidamente 
as transformações que nós precisamos. Ok, let me speak for the U.S. And you can, that way I won't pick on Brazil. In the U.S., the political system is, they think backwards. They don't even think about the future. However, here's the good news. Um, again, over 30 years, and you say in terms of like which, cli which uh, clients have become more interested in the future, it's government. Not political parties, but government. So national efforts to study the future, Singapore, United Arab Emirates, Finland, like more and more countries have national governments that are looking to the future. Now here's the real surprise. We're actually working now with local governments. I can tell you for 20 years, we called it a dead zone. Nobody in local government was thinking about the future. But what's happening in the US, because the national government is kind of stalemated, all the responsibility goes down to the local level, so they have to do it. And they come into us and say, how do we do this? So I would say that it's the political tough, but local and national governments are both increasingly turning to the future. They need a lot of help, though. They've never done it before. So it's happening, it's slow, but it's, I'm, I'm super excited by it. Hi, Andy. Thank you. Hi, Andy. Thank you for all your talking and to give us some hope that for to be desirable futures. But it's, it seems that our scientists tell us that you don't have time. All this time that you're saying that you need for you change our habits and change our economy. And you're telling that you need lot of time, but you don't have it. And when, uh, when I say this this morning, our presentation about how we adapt ourselves for this new climb, it seems that you are just, it's coming and you don't have anything to do about it. And I don't see the talking about what you can do for changing it, like how you can produce different our food, how Petrobras is giving like nine percent of uh, new energy and the rest for all for look for more the same oil so I get very worried about how we get this time right oh oh my um, again studying the long-term future we started talking about climate change in the 1990s and then it gets into the 2000s and 2010s and we start talking more urgently like oh come on now pay attention I would say awareness is definitely high now. Awareness, awareness, but action. And to your point, um, it doesn't, uh, that, that is now horizon one. Climate change is here, it's horizon one. It means act now. I absolutely agree with uh, what the previous presenter said. It is here. This is not like the future. <laughs> it's not the future anymore, it's here. So. You know, pri current priorities should be number one. Absolutely. Horizon one, it is here, it's not the future. Agreed. But we can do more than one thing. That's, I guess that's the point. It's like, that's the most important thing to do, but we can do other things too. If we survive. <laughs> yeah, I will say as futurists, you almost, you have to be kind of positive by nature. Right? You have to be. You have to believe that if we do this work, we will actually change the future. If you don't believe that, oh my gosh, that would be very depressing. But we believe that we can do it. Okay. Other questions? Hi. Um, I'm going to do it in English. <laughs> so you talked about the three horizons, and I was wondering uh, when, you, when you think about identifying key drivers of change, how do you deal with something like a pandemic that wasn't exactly foreseeable for, by most people? I know Bill Gates foresaw it, and <laughs> but um, should that already be mapped out in Horizon 3, or do you have to adapt the scenarios? All right, we, we got a ringer here that really knows their stuff. That's a great question. 
many futurists, many public health people said, it is only a matter of when. There is going to be a global pandemic. We wrote about global pandemics in 1996. I mean, it was everyone who thought, who studied it, said this is going to happen. Okay. What is our advice about, we call it a wild card. Something that it could just spring out of nowhere. You know it could happen, but you really just don't know when. And it could be really disruptive. We tell our clients is they should, our clients should be aware of wild cards that affect their particular domain. So if you're in finance, you should be aware of crypto meltdown. If you're in public health, you should be aware of pandemics. Um, and if you're in, I don't know, if you're in the a food business, you should be aware of a, a global food supply shortage. So because if you're in a bank, do you really need to be worried about food supply shortage? Well, not, I mean, kind of, but you don't have, you can't plan for everything. So what we say is, you know, know what are the major surprises in your area and know those, and then just generally be flexible and ready to respond to disaster. But you can't study everything. You can't study, you can't prepare for every wild card. So you gotta hope that the other sectors do their homework, right? Public health does all its homework. Well, they did pretty good. <laughs> um, so that, that's our advice, right? Know the wild cards in your sector and then hope that everybody else does their own homework. Um, uh, time. Time is it right. All right, it's over, baby. All right. So thanks very much for all your questions and for staying and, and, and listening about the future.